we are getting ready to start another journey together, and this lecture is going to concern electron delocalization. Now, delocalization will probably make it go loco, but that's a different definition of localization than what we use in organic. And we've really already discussed a little bit about delocalization. If you remember, a couple of lecture modules back, we were discussing the difference between what we called a localized electron and a delocalized electron. And we said that delocalized electrons, you know, they moved throughout the molecule. And that's really the major difference between localized and delocalized. So this really happened way back in lecture module one, folks. That's when we first introduced this. And if you go back and watch those videos, I guarantee you that I probably told you at that point, oh, well, we're just going to introduce the definition now. And then later on, we are really going to focus in more detail about delocalization and localized electrons. And now's the time, folks. Now's the time that we're going to talk about this in major detail and probably drive you crazy in the meantime. So there's a couple of rules for delocalization and really that's all that this lecture is going to focus on. How to determine if something like this with benzene or something like this with cyclohexane has delocalized electrons or not. So there's a couple of rules that we use in order to determine that. And once we get comfortable with that, we will then turn our focus on maybe one extra reaction that we haven't yet seen. And it's a special type of reaction that has a special little fancy name that goes along with it. So that's how we'll end this lecture module series. All right, so let's first talk about localized and delocalized and do a recap up until this point. So first, we're going to go back and we're going to talk about this Lewis dot diagram. So during the time that we were doing these example problems, we were like, what is the electron center? And it could have been, or the molecule center, and that could have been carbon. And then around that was a hydrogen, and maybe a hydrogen, and maybe a hydrogen, and maybe a hydrogen. And that would be the a Lewis dot structure for methane that we know is methane now. So we did this total valence electron count. We said that carbon had four valence. That came from the periodic table as far as the group number goes. We also said that hydrogen had one valence. So we have a total of four. That gives me four plus four, which is an eight. And each line that we drew from the structure represented two electrons. So two, four, six, and eight. And folks, we are now finished with the Lewis dot structure. All right, so this is kind of where we ended. And back in the day, I told you that any time you see this connection, all right, this bond is really the glue that keeps the carbon and the hydrogen together. These two electrons, well, they can't really move, okay? If they did move, that bond would not be there, the glue would not be there, and carbon and hydrogen would not be connected together like that. So they pretty much are stuck. I mean, I hate to tell them, but they are already rooted they are already kind of in life where they need to be, and they have no major plans of going anywhere else from that point on. So they will not move, and if they do not move, we call these localized electrons. All right, but those weren't the only type of localized electrons that we had in a molecule. That was just one version, and that's a very easy version to pick out. Anytime I see a line like that, that line has to be there, or that structure is not going to be connected in the way that I've drawn it. Another type of localized electron that really doesn't involve lines. Okay, well, let's see if we can look at one of those. Let's look at something like CH3 and then CH and CH3 and off of this middle carbon let's put another OH group or NOH group. Well this oxygen if I really want it to do Lewis dot totally perfectly legit 
I really do have to include those two sets of electrons that are there at the OH group, right? We know that oxygen typically carries two sets with two bonds. So those two sets are there. Most of the time we don't draw them, but they're understood to be there. Well, these are electron pairs. So I'm just going to circle a pairing of them. There we go. One pair and two pair. And the question that people tend to always have in the delocalized theory, it, are those permanent? And the answer is yeah. Those are permanent as of right now. So what that basically means is that oxygen really does need two sets of electrons. And those electrons are going to look throughout the molecule. That's the key. They're going to look through the molecule and they're going to question, is there a better place for me in life? Right? So right now I'm stuck on this oxygen. Right now I'm in a relationship with this oxygen. Is this really where I need to be? Or is there something better? Is there a greener pasture somewhere? Do I just need to uproot, get up and move, cut all tides that I have here with the oxygen? And can I find a better spot for me throughout the molecule? Yes or no? And in this case, the molecule doesn't. Now, you're questioning why. And we'll get to that point. But these free sets of electrons, the point that I'm trying to get across, is that in this example, those are not going to move either. They're going to stay put. So that means that these are also localized electrons. There's nowhere else for them to be. So they stay where they are. They do not move through the molecule at all. So here are two examples of what we would call localized system or localized electrons. They're stuck. They cannot move. They're kind of where they need to be from here on out through the lifetime of the molecule. And there's nothing that those electrons can do about it. But as you can imagine, and maybe you're like this, there are some electrons that would prefer not to be in this position for the rest of their life. They want to get out. They want to see the world. They want to, you know, experiment and experience life to the fullest. And those electrons are what we call delocalized. Now, we did do an example of delocalized back in Module 1. If you remembered, there were times like this CO3 group. We would draw these structures, right? So carbon would go in the center, and then oxygens would go around it. Da-da-da, there you go. Carbon's got four valence. Oxygen has six valence, and there's three of them, so that's 18 and four. Well, 18 and four, what is that, folks? It's 22. And then we also had this extra two up here because it had a negative two charge. So that means there's two extras that it's carrying with it. So I'll add two more onto that and I'll get a total of 24. Well, I've just taken care of two, four, six of them. All right. Well, what does that give you as a total? Uh, if you can do the math in your head, it's 18 left, folks. 18 left. So I've got 18 dots that I need to put around the structure. And we always said we start on the outside and we work ourselves inside. We do that last. All right, so 18 dots. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, 10, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, right? So we looked at all the oxygens at this point and we said, hey, look, this oxygen's got two, four, six, and then two more from the bond. That's a total of eight. And then that oxygen has eight and this oxygen has eight and uh, that carbon, it only has six. So do you remember how we fix this problem? Everything really needs octet, at least in the beginnings that we start drawing these structures. Not everything actually requires octet, believe it or not, but in these early examples they do. So this particular carbon in the center, it needs eight, it only has six, it needs two more. And the way that we fixed it is we said, hey, listen, we can erase two dots 
from one of these atoms. That's all that we need to do. And they can be shared between carbon and that oxygen. This oxygen still has eight, two and four from the dots, six from the first line, eight from the second line. There's your eight. And now the carbon in the center does have eight, two, four, six, and eight. So now we have a Lewis dot structure that fully represents a happy molecule. The problem though, when we did these, is we said, I could have erased two dots up here at the top and I could have drawn a double line there, right? That would have worked and that is one more option for you to do. And then down here at the bottom, instead of bottom left, I could have went bottom right. And we said, this is an option for us to do. And if you did that, you would be correct. That is what we call a resonance form. You remember that? But then we said, eh, these resonance forms are great and all. But to be honest with you, a resonance form doesn't really exist. This is just one variant that that molecule can show itself in. Really what we have is a resonance hybrid. And a hybrid is more true to form. So what we said is that this carbon, you know, was connected to three oxygens and there we go. But the double bond could have happened here or the double bond could have happened there, or the double bond could have happened here, and we did that with a dashed dotted line. And we said that this was the resonance hybrid. I'm showing all the possibilities of where that double bond could exist. Now we're a little further in the course. Now we can talk about this in a little bit more detail and have really a better understanding of what's at play. The reason that I say that is because these electrons can move through the molecule. All of my solid lines, they have to be there, folks. That glue has to hold carbon and oxygen together. Those are localized. So this compound does have localized electrons. They have to stay put. But because I have these options, you know, a pair of electrons, they could be here, or a pair of electrons could be there, or a pair of electrons could be there. Folks, they're looking at more in life. They're looking at where else they could be. Where else could they fit in? Where else could they start a life and be happy? And in this particular molecule, those electrons have three possibilities. They just really have to kind of figure out where they want to be. But here's the problem. Let's say that they are in Wilmington right now and they're happy for a little bit and then they go, oh gosh, Wilmington, it's such a small area. Everybody knows each other. I need something bigger and better in life. And then they move upward. They go to Raleigh and then they go to Raleigh and they go, oh, I, this is great. I love this. This is the best choice ever. And then after they're there for a little bit, they're like, God, I hate this traffic. What are all these people doing moving to Raleigh-Durham? I, I stay in traffic for hours and hours and I only go one or two miles. I'm out of here. See you, folks. And then they move on to the next better place. Maybe they go to Asheville. Oh, yeah, Asheville's great. I'm on the sidewalks. Everybody's just so laid back and chill. And, you know, I go to the city parks and people are, you know, drumming the drums and dancing in the street. And I just love it. And then one day they wake up and they say, Asheville's up in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. I don't need to be here. I really like the beach. I've missed the beach so much. And then they move back to Wilmington. Folks, this is a pattern that happens over and over and over. 
So what I'm trying to get across to you is that sometimes Route 1 is okay. Sometimes Route 2 is okay. Sometimes Route 3 is okay. And those electrons that can move will take advantage of every spot that they can be present in. And they will keep rotating over and over and over and over. And that is why we do a hybrid representation. It shows you exactly where these electrons could end up being in a molecule. And it really is their option. At that moment in time, where do they want to be? And that's this whole concept of delocalization. So if we want to define delocalization, there's a couple of things that we could do. All right. So delocalization. Number one the electrons will move through the molecule. That is a delocalized electron. Now, maybe they'll move through the entire molecule. That's okay. They can move through the entire state. That's fine. Or maybe they will only move within a certain area. Maybe Wilmington, Raleigh, back to Wilmington and so forth. Maybe that's all that they do. Or Wilmington to Jacksonville, Jacksonville back to Wilmington. That's all that they do. So they don't have to go through the entire molecule is what I'm saying. They can just be a little gypsy electrons that only will travel between a very small certain area in the molecule, and that's fine. We still call that delocalization. Number two, we're going to say they do not belong to a certain atom. They never settle down. They never get in serious relationships. When they pack up and leave, they sever all ties and they go to the new location and they hang out there for a while. Maybe they make new relationships there. But folks, one day they're going to wake up and say, I'm tired of this too. And they're going to get up and just move and maybe not tell anybody about it. Poor little delocalized. I mean, could you imagine these electrons just don't seem very happy to me? But maybe I'm fooled. Maybe that is what makes them happy. Traveling and going from place to place and never settling down. Number three, we often say that they are shared. And they are shared typically with at least three atoms. Oh, gosh, now we're stepping in it a little bit. A poor little delocalized electron in a relationship with three different atoms can't ever make up their mind on where they want to be or who they want to see. They've got a boyfriend or a girlfriend in Wilmington. They've got one in Raleigh. They have one in Charlotte. And they just migrate and move. And all of those other atoms have no clue that the others exist. The drama and the soap opera of an organic chemistry reaction and molecule. Hmm. Number four, we also say that they typically happen in flat molecules or flat areas within the molecule. What we're talking about here are P overlaps. So P overlap. What's a P? Do you remember what a P electron was? Well, I hope that you're going to tell me these are electrons that are in a P orbital, S, P, D, F, right? And those lobes overlap to create your double bonds. They could also create your triple bonds. But they could also just be electron sets that are just kind of out there as well. So we're going to have to take a closer look at the P chemistry that happens in an organic molecule. So here are four rules that we look at. right? Just a generalization of a delocalized electron and we're going to give you more specific rules. I am, at least. Again, I'm talking about myself in plural. Why do I do that? Multiple personalities? Uh, move over, Sybil, right? Okay. So here's an example of localized and delocalized electrons. Um, in this case, localized only. 
So what we're looking at to the molecule of the left, this is methylamine. You should know how to name that at this point, right? Methyl group, NH2 is the amine group, so common name methylamine. And it looks like this bond, it has to be there. And they're just highlighting that particular bond. So because it has to be there, folks, that is a localized electron. Okay, this free set of electrons, well, they're going to look, they're going to see, is there a better spot for me to go? And they're going to realize, no, there's not a better spot for me to go. Nitrogen needs three bonds and a set of electrons, and I'm staying here because nothing else is convincing or nothing else is more satisfying than the spot that I am in now. So that's also a localized electron, another free set that is staying put. Over here to the right-hand side, you see them put in a alkene into the mix, right? So if I look at this alkene, this is a 1, 2, 3, it is a propene. So this propene molecule also has localized electrons. Of course, the single bond is localized. It has to stay there. That's the glue that holds the two carbons together. It can't move anywhere. So that is a localized network. If I look over to the right-hand side, folks, that is a double bond as well. So one of these is an absolute have to right? One of those has to stay. One of those has to be there to connect those two carbons together. So those are localized. The question that we have in that double bond is the other set delocalized or not. So the other set of electrons that represents that double bond, they will have eyes as well. Is there a better place for me to be? Is there a better place in this world that I need to be to make me happier? And the, those electrons are going to look close by, and they're going to be like, no, I'm kind of happy. I'm in a good spot. I'm in a good position. I've got some things going for me. There's no reason for me to move. So for that reason, those sets of electrons are also localized, which makes the entire double bond localized. That doesn't happen every single time, all right? And if you've noticed, I've been very careful. I have said, these electrons will look around. They will make that decision. But we don't really know what goes into that decision, do we? Not yet. We'll get to that point, but not yet. Now, if you want to look at delocalized, here's another example of delocalization. So here we have a methyl group, CH3, on the C, W, O, and O. You know, if this was at like an H out here, this would almost be like a carboxylic acid, right? C double bond O with an OH. So this is getting us closer to the world of organic a little bit because of that. All right, well, if I look at this structure, the same thing happens what happened in our Lewis structure that we did together. I'm going to get an area where this oxygen has two pairs of electrons and this oxygen's got two pairs of electrons. Well, they probably had three at one point, but one could move inward and create a double bond there to satisfy an octet. And if I could do it on one of the oxygens, folks, I can do it on the other oxygen too. So that's the dashed line and that's what that represents. Hey, I could erase two dots on that oxygen and draw the line there and that would be okay. And those dashed bonds represent delocalized electrons. They are electrons that can move throughout a molecule. Now, the funny thing happens here. Before I tell you the rules that these electrons, the decision factors that go into whether or not an electron is delocalized or not, a funny thing happens here in history. And this really concerns the structure of benzene. Okay, I'm not going to show you the structure of benzene yet. But why was benzene so important? Well, here's the problem. Uh, way back when, when studies were first done on benzene, they were trying to draw structures like this on a sheet of paper. right? How do we represent benzene? How do we do that? Well, some of the early studies from the lab told us that benzene had six carbons and it has six hydrogens. So people scratched their head and they said, six carbons and six hydrogens? Huh. 
Well, how could we connect these carbons and these hydrogens together in order to make them all happy? Is it a straight chain? Okay, well, let's see. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So there's six carbons. And it only has six hydrogens, right? Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm. I'm short some hydrogens, right? Look how many more I would need. If benzene was an alkane, this is a 2N plus 2. So 6 times 2 is 12, plus 2 is 14. It would need 14 hydrogens. But folks, it does not. It only has 6. And then they sit down again and said, okay, well, what about an alkene? Let's try an alkene. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And they drew an extra bond. And then they went back and put some hydrogens on it. Maybe this will work. Or maybe it will get us closer. Who knows? But we're going to try it. So this carbon only needs two, one, two. This one needs one, three, four, five, six, and now I stop. So they look at this molecule and they said, you know, we got a little bit closer to satisfying the octets on everything, didn't we? I mean, we were able to take these hydrogens further in the molecule before we ran out. And we now know that if we have an alkene, this is really just simply 2N. So 6 times 2 is going to be 12. I would need 12 hydrogens, and I don't. I only have 6. So then someone said, okay, well, what about multiple bonds? What if we take these carbons... And what if we go into this Lewis dot structure and do one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll put a double bond here and maybe a double bond here and maybe a double bond there. You can have more than one alkene. We know that. We've named them. We've drawn them. We've done reactions and stuff. Maybe with them. Or have we? Uh-oh. Now I see where this maybe is going. So if I go through and add on the hydrogens... Two carbons, so two bonds, so two more. So that gives me a total of four. This carbon has one. Then this carbon, one, two, three, that needs one. This carbon, one, two, three, this one needs one. This carbon, one, two, three, that one needs one. How many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six. Hmm, I ran out. But I still need two more, right? I still need two more hydrogens to make this work. I got even closer. But folks, what if, and this is what someone did, what if we could come over here to the side? Let me erase some of this. And with all of these rules in mind, Think about the idea of three bonds. That got me way, way close. And I just need room for two more hydrogens. I need to make up for two more. And then someone wised up and said, well, why don't you just make a ring? Because every time we do a ring, we take two away, don't we? Well, okay. All right. That works for me. So... Let me draw that carbon a little bit better. And we'll still put the alternating double and single bonds in. Double, single, double, single, double, single. And now let's put on the hydrogens. How many do we actually need here? Well, this carbon has three bonds, so it needs one more. This carbon has three. 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 It only needs one. And this carbon has three. It only needs one. Folks, look at what we just did. We used Lewis dot structures to help me determine the structure of benzene based on the elemental composition of it. Six carbons, six hydrogens. This is all that you have. And here I've got six carbons. And here I've drawn six hydrogens. And everybody has the octet. So, they're like, Eureka, we found it. 
here is the structure of benzene. So what we decide to do is take that drawing and simplify it down. So we'll take my ring structure, cyclohexane, with a double, single, double, single, double. We leave off all the hydrogens, make it like a skeletal structure, and there you go. So we say, ding, ding, we got it. But there was some confusion. There was some confusion here because this folk is an alkene. Alkenes have reactions. I break the double bond. I add two groups on, H and BR, or H and OH, or BR and BR, or H and H. We've talked about so many different alkene reactions, right? The problem, though, is that this structure, it was an alkene, there were three double bonds, but folks, it didn't really undergo any of the alkene reactions. And now people scratch their head even more. So what happened with this? What's going on? Now we'll figure that out in the next video.